Hey crew, how are you? Hey, it's Coach here. Hey, I was uh, taking a few minutes and here's a real quick down and dirty story for you. It, it was not but just a few days ago I was sitting in the barber chair. I was thinking of this week's topic as Mr. Barber there was throwing the apron over me and getting ready and I, I'm... The barber suddenly asked me, Will, young fella, how much are we taking off for you today? And bam, there it was. We're talking about pruning. Pruning since we are getting into the prime time for many of you and for the rest of you, soon to be. Maybe a few weeks down the road, maybe a little bit more, but soon to be for the rest. You know, I really hope your week was a good one. Let's get this one underway, shall we? Hey, by the way, please consider following along on this podcast and drop in a comment. If you ever listen to it on the YouTube podcast, drop a comment, give me a like. I would very much appreciate it as the channel is starting to grow just a little bit. Hey, and I appreciate that. Hey, I'm Matt. You can call me coach. Every Friday, I bring with me landscape DIY education, concepts and theories, ideas and solutions, so you guys can go out and tackle a landscape project yourself, get professional results, save a whole lot of money in the process, and in this day and age, be a lot more self-reliant. Man, after a 20 plus year career in the green industry, I'm bringing with me a lot of knowledge and experience that I wanna share with you guys, the new modern educated self-reliant homeowner of today. If you can remember, if you can remember any form of your English literature classes or your creative writing classes, either in high school or college, teachers generally told you about five W's and an H. And, oh, okay, what? Wait a minute, coach. Didn't you tell us this week is about pruning, right? Yes, yes, you're right. But I'm going to present it with the five W's and an H, which is gonna basically make it in such a simple manner, it will be easy to absorb as far as content and easier to remember. So we have pruning, we have pruning. Got it? Copy that, Tomcat, very good. All right, so let's move forward. The who, the who, and I'm not talking about the band, I'm talking about the person who is actually gonna be doing the task or persons who are gonna be doing the task. The what? What are you pruning exactly? Are you doing perennials? Are you doing fruit trees? Are you doing citrus? Are you doing flowering ornamentals? Are you doing ornamental grasses? Are you doing ground covers? And the ever most popular, most demanding pruning you will ever do. Can you guess what it is? That's right, your lawns every week, whether you want to or not. How about the wear? The cut themselves and a few extras, but you'll have to stay with me on that one. The why. Why do we prune? Well, it's somewhat self-explanatory, but hey, you know, for some of you, why do we prune? I will get into that later in this episode. How about the when? The when is the time of year. Believe it or not, the time of day. And what is the weather like when you're considering it? It will make a difference. And of course, last but certainly not least, the how. Now briefly, I'm not gonna go into in-depth pruning of everything that there is. Holy crap, this will be a very, very long podcast for sure. But briefly, I'm gonna go into it. And if you have specific questions, I'll tell you how to handle that as well. So, how's your pruning knowledge? If it is really high, you will probably go, ah, maybe this podcast is just too rudimentary. But you know something? Hey, at least before you go, give me a like or a, a good comment or something. It takes a lot to put these puppies together. And even though you may not be a newbie, bet you could learn something if you just hang in there. If you are a rookie, if you are a noob and want to learn, stick with the video or stick with this podcast and get the whole educational value out of it. My goal here is to be not only complete and thorough, but also walk that fine tightrope line, not to bore you and send you away to your daily nappy on your little rug, rather than learning a valuable horticultural and maintenance task that is just paramount in the home landscape. So let's go through some of those W's, shall we? Who is doing the task? Is this a family job where 
the whole fam family is involved in it? Is it maybe just a couple's job, just mom and dad, or you and your significant? Or is that a solo Lobo job where you're doing it all, start to finish? The reason I ask is a few things come to bear depending on how you're approaching it. First of all, it's the amount of time and the managing of that time on this particular task. When you're talking about pruning, uh, it could be really, really quick because you don't have a lot of things, or it could be an all day gig, depending on how much you have to do. Also your skill level. If you're super skilled, it's going to go a lot faster, obviously, but if you're just getting the hang of it, you know, it's going to take you a little longer and as it should. If you're a rookie and you're jumping out there and you're done, you know, you blow through 15 roses in 15 minutes, chances are the job probably wasn't very thorough. Hey, the other reason is tool allocation. You got four people doing this and you only have one hand pruner. How are you going to do that? Seriously. Or if you have a, a whole bunch of cherry trees that you're going to have to nip and tuck. You know, how many lopping shears do you have? All of this comes into play as we approach this late winter task. So that's the who of it. You know, for me, it, it was the solo lobo at all times. I was the lone wolf out in the landscape pretty much 98% of the time, except during planting when Maestro helped out quite a bit, partly because I love doing this stuff. I really do. And it is partly because others did not, you know, they just, it wasn't their bailiwick. Kind of a weird, how should I say it? Kind of a weird me time, if you want to look at it that way, which was totally cathartic in nature. I'd love putting in an audible book or something and getting out there on a, on a frosty early February morning and starting to go to town on roses or, or, olive trees or whatever it was, except for that olive orchard, you know, which was, it was just a ball buster. I, I don't care how you looked at it. It was a three week ball buster for me. When you're doing 94 trees from start to finish by yourself and then loading it all up and getting rid of it. Yeah, it was a, it was, it was quite a task, but the other stuff, perennials and roses and fruit trees and citrus and blah, blah, blah. Those are always just a pleasure. That's why I never when we were on Weed Patch Ranch, I never walked out the door 95% of the time. If I was home, never walked out of the door without my hand pruners on my hip. I know, that's kind of weird, huh? So let's talk about the what. What are you going to be pruning? Some may have small orchards like, like I did at Weed Patch Ranch. I mean, we had stone fruit orchard. We had small apple orchard. We had a few plums. We had citrus. We had lots of ornamentals. We had the olive orchard. So we had quite a bit, you know, now some of you, you may have two peach trees and call it good. So it's not going to take you very long. I mean, you may have, maybe if you're doing it on an annual basis, like you should, you may have an hour's worth of work and you'd be done. And yet others might have a multitude of fruit and ornamentals like I did. And that late winter attention, holy cow, may take you a weekend, if not a couple of weekends. The what in pruning is important because it will also be attached to some other W's, especially the when and the why. I'll explain that as we go through the others. So let's talk about the where. Where has to do with a few things. Where to actually make the pruning cuts themselves on the particular plant or tree that it needs. The where. Now, I will say this more than once in this episode. If you want, if you have two apple trees, and you want to know exactly how to prune them. I could spend the next three hours on talking about various pruning techniques for various plants, various fruit trees, various citrus, various ornamental grab, blah, blah. It would be well into the three and four hour mark. So I suggest this is you go to YouTube and you say, Hey, I've got a couple apple trees, how to prune an apple tree. Okay. Or how to prune a mature apple tree how to prune a neglected apple tree. There you will find a plethora of probably 20 plus different videos that you can immerse yourself in. Okay. So let's continue on the where. How about where the tree is located, where the bush is located, the shrub, grass is located, and what neighbors, what landscape neighbors does it have? Here's a for instance. Say for instance, you have a, uh, a little, hedge row of miscanthus ornamental grass and it is 
staggered and spaced in a large in a large planting bed you have and you have some perennials you have a few ornamental shrubs and you have a plethora of bulbs and these bulbs right now in february if they haven't already started to push are pushing up so the wear becomes really important because you can't just go stormtrooper in and start doing your ornamental grass pruning and you're trampling all over the brand new shoots and everything of these bulbs that are coming up you're going to ruin your season your bulb season anyway so the wares now if you think about it this will also double back on how you planted and how you spaced originally this whole bed give yourself a little space a little maintenance space so you're daffodils your mascari your liriopes or what tulips whatever you've planted is at least three feet or so away from your ornamental grasses that way you're not trampling them you're really not each variety of plant will have specifics on where to place your cuts i could make this a huge long episode if i covered every pruning technique but i've already given you permission to check other people's channels out and look at that from a really in-depth perspective remember some specifics angled cuts above the bud know the difference between a leaf bud and a flowering bud and you guys are going to be fine you really will if you want to go one step further if you have a particular plant that you're looking to prune guys i am only an email away you can ask any question safely and there is there is no ridicule coming at you there's only answers so check that out. I would really prefer you do the email thing and stay in touch with me rather than me sending you over to who knows who. But hey, you guys make your own best decision. So moving on to the why. The why we prune is the holy grail, is the cornucopia question on this broad-based topic. Every prunable plant will perform better, will last longer, will certainly stay healthier it will fit better where you have put it and in the end make you shine as a self-reliant homeowner of today it really will this is the why behind what we do if you want more fruit of whatever particular plant you want fruit from if you want more fruit if you want bigger fruit if you want less limb breaks because you uh, somewhere in june you forgot to thin out the peach tree less limb break in other words if you'd like to have a much more neater manicured landscape and finally kicking a new season off every single year in a very rejuvenating way not only for yourself but also for the plants that you have painstakingly taken care of this is the why we prune those plants that need it oh by the way many of these same winter prune plants may also need some attention during the growing season as well many times right after harvest and in some cases as ripening is starting to occur and right after thinning why air circulation sunshine penetrating into the center of plants that's why when you do a lot of your fruit tree pruning you're always kind of striving for that open vase center so that balanced sunlight gets in there from dawn to dusk you know picture this if you took your your left hand for a second and you put it out in front and you're looking at the back of your palm now take that hand and invert it so your fingers are pointing towards the, the ceiling or the sky. And you see that open vase that you have down inside your hand there? That's going to be the base of most of your fruit trees, most of your citrus trees. So that sunlight and air circulation gets down in there and does its job. And later in the growing season, you will greatly appreciate you having that kind of maintained and manicured fruit tree so that you have the optimum sugar performance in your fruit, air circulation, and visual visualness so you can identify pest diseases and ripeness of your fruit don't forget that that inverted finger look very very important so moving on the when the when is mainly focused on the dormant time of many fruit trees bearing shrubs ornamental grasses and berries it's just plain and simple we do it in the late part of winter before any sort of bud break 
that is the main focus as far as when. Now, with that being said, there's always caveats. Some growing season pruning comes into play with things like perennials for an extended blooming season. Instead of just having your, your tick seed blooming one time, you know, stopping, going to seed and just kind of existing the rest of the year, you knock it down after the primary bloom and let it come back six weeks later. And you got a second and a third and a fourth bloom out of that tick seed. Very easy. So when, when becomes very important. Your perennial flowers may be during the growing season as well as the winter season. Another time of when is emergency pruning. Emergency pruning for safety, not only for yourself, but maybe your dwelling, maybe your driveway, your vehicles, whatever it might be, because uh, maybe of a, a weather-borne event that happened. And then finally, when is because tidiness of the landscape is an ongoing and regular basic principle of landscape maintenance. You know, if you have a particular citrus tree, uh, let's just take, for example, a, a Eureka lemon, and you go in there and nip and tuck it for great shape, you know, and it looks good, and you got lots of lemons that are coming on. But then those damn water sprouts start shooting up through the center. And can you imagine, I have seen citrus water sprouts come up from the base or below the graft, basically from the original rootstock, so fast they put on like six to eight inches a day. Imagine how much energy that plant is having to put into that water sprout as opposed into the tree and the fruit itself. So in the middle of season when things are becoming ripe and you got those water sprouts, hey, yeah, the when you're getting in there and taking those things out as soon as you see them. And be careful because some of them, like Eureka lemon water sprouts, they have sometimes as much as three and four inch thorns that will go right through a very good glove. And if you are silly enough to go in there and start pruning a Eureka lemon without protective hand gear, you're silly. So take it from coach. Make sure you look before you cut. And when you cut, you know how you're gonna pull it out of there, plain and simple. But most of the time, the when, we're focusing on the winter prune. So the when is now. Now, if you're watching this on the original release of this particular video, the now is anywhere from late January to early March, depending on where you live. Anyway, wherever you're at, it's always, always before and up to just before bud break. Way up north, not only in the States, but anywhere. If you're above the 45th parallel and higher, you guys still have some time yet. You really do. Like quite a few weeks still before you have to worry about this. I would say into late March even and beyond, depending on how far north you are. But I'll tell you what, knowing your landscape and what it consists of will be a great leg up knowledge wise for when, for when to do your pruning. Perennials are different than citrus. Citrus is different than a cherry tree. A cherry tree is different than blackberries. Blackberries are different than blueberries. So knowing what you have and perfecting your craft on what you have in the landscape is gonna make loads of difference as far as health and vitality, front yard and backyard, I guarantee it. Here is just a few for instances as far as maybe a little uh, deeper dive as far as when to pay attention to them. When we talk about ornamental grasses, we have annual grasses like um, Penicetum. Penicetum oftentimes, especially in the northern latitudes, those things are annuals. They're not gonna winter over. Not unless you bring them into a greenhouse or you bring them indoors. Yeah, when you look at that fountain grass stuff, chances are it's a, it's a one and done. But when you look at some other ones, Miscanthus and Carl Forrester grass and things like that, you're talking about a late winter and a late winter pruning after, I would say, after a lot of your known weather, your frosts are pretty much done. You're gonna take them down to, you know, six to eight inches or so, maybe four to six inches. You're gonna clean, clean up in and around them and maybe a little shaping during the growing season, especially for things like miscanthus. Sometimes it can get a little out of control. Uh, a great tip that I learned many years ago and that is if you have a fairly good mature ornamental grass and how to do it very easily is you can go in there with either string or a bungee cord and throw it around the whole bush 
and kind of bring it up into a, a compact ball and then cut right below it. Cut right below the, the bungee cord. And now you've got this already contained mound of grass that you can carefully take and put in your wheelbarrow. Remember this. And this is, a, this is important if you don't want some of these ornamental grasses spreading where you don't want them. Remember those beautiful seed heads that you enjoyed during the growing season into the fall and in some cases into the winter. Well, they're called seed heads for a reason. And that's because they do contain seed of the plant. And if you get in there and get all aggressive and you start pruning these ornamental grasses up and taking them and throwing them in a pile and then later picking them up and putting them in a wheelbarrow or putting them into a trailer or into the recycle bin, you start shaking and knocking all those seeds loose, sometimes you'll have ornamental grass where you did not intend it. So my suggestion, and this is something I have personally done on a regular basis, is I don't mind enjoying a wintered grass for a little while with its seed heads. But most of the time, I go in there and I chop those things out long before Christmas. And then I'll let the foliage stay there. The foliage is not going to spread anything. But those, those seed heads, you got to be careful. Okay? And that goes for a lot of the ornamental grasses. They may be ornamental. It doesn't mean they won't spread on you. Okay, let's look at fruit trees. These are always, as a rule, if they're dormant fruit trees, mid to late winter for cherries and peaches and apples, nectarines, pears, plums, prunes, figs, blah, it goes on and on. This is all mid to late winter. Good culture is always advised uh, as far as if you have uh, cherry trees, especially out on the west coast, sometimes you can get into that disease pseudomonas. And if you start cutting through infected wood and stuff, you're really gonna need to sterilize those pruning shears so you don't go spreading that that uh, bacteria into healthy tissue. Now, with that winter pruning mentioned, sometimes light pruning during the growing season in kind of a nip and tuck fashion will get rid of sucker growth shape. If you have some wild hair that decides to cross across the, the scaffolding of your particular tree and it just doesn't make any sense, you go in there and successfully prune it out in the middle of the season, you're not gonna hurt anything. And then also shape and like I said, disease control. So. Fruit trees, mainly mid to late winter, and then the occasional nip and tuck. There's a couple uh, channels out there on YouTube where it really shows some aggressive, and I mean uber aggressive, pruning for things like cherry trees. There's, uh, there's one channel out there that teaches you about the KBG style of pruning cherry trees, and I had not seen that. Check it out if you get a chance. Very aggressive approach to new and then teenage age plants as far as uh, pruning cherry trees. Okay, moving on. How about some berries? Who does not like a ripe blueberry or a ripe on the vine blackberry? One of my favorite fruits ever, 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 ever. Maestro and I love to be out on the Oregon coast and uh, the Northern California coast and even some places up in the, the Northeast like Maine and Vermont, New Hampshire, when the berries come into season. Oh my gosh. One of the greatest times we had this summer was being up in Maine and we spent like two hours on the side of a road out in the middle of nowhere and we're talking hilltops, hilltops of ground level huckleberry and blueberry patches. Just ate and gathered, ate and gathered, ate and gathered for quite a few hours. Very, very enjoyable. But berries are mostly late winter and a little mid-season pruning here and there for like navigation in and around, uh, maybe thinning for some air circulation. One great uh, berry pruning tip is on the canes that we talk about, the first year canes known as primacanes, uh, is pinching those big very aggressive first year canes, about six, eight inches down from the tip. You can do it with your thumbnail or you can do it with a hand pruner and it will give throughout the rest of that season, it'll give some side shoots. And then those side shoots plus the prima cane next year meals that much more on that particular cane as far as production of flower and fruit. Remember most berries like blacks and boysens, logans and raspberries, they will be kind of biennial in nature as far as productivity. And what do I mean by biennial? Well, take it this way. The first year they grow, it's a vegetative growth, a very rapid and energetic vegetative growth for the most part. Then they go to sleep. Year two, year two, they will have side shoots that will give you flower and bear the fruit that you're so much looking for. 
So we call them primocanes for obvious reasons. Prima meaning Latin first cane. And then the second year is the flora cane. After year two, those canes kind of just exist and they kind of are, are like a, a ball and chain to the rest of the plant. So go in there at the end of the fruit bearing season and remove them because you will have other primocanes coming up ready for the following year. So a little tip on berry growing. Citrus, if you guys are lucky, if you guys are lucky enough to grow citrus, one of my favorite plants on the face of the earth, almost any time of year, you can do light cosmetic pruning without any damage. In the border zones, like uh, 9A, 9B, some of those zones where you can get frost damage, be careful forcing any new growth in the fall or so where you're gonna be forcing out new stuff come November or whatever, because that stuff, you know, zones A, zones 9A and 9B, oftentimes you'll get that late fall frost or even freeze, and man, you will wipe those, that new growth out, you will. Citrus is also very, uh, very adaptable to heavy pruning, heavy skeletal pruning. I have, I have done this myself back in Northern California in 1990, late November, we had the frost of the century and we had deep, deep freezes down into the low 20s. And it wiped out one of my oranges and wiped out one of my uh, lemons. And these were standard size, these weren't dwarfs. And it, it killed the tree 50% back. It, it just annihilated it. And I went out there late winter after the, the risk of frost and I trimmed that thing back to not a stump, certainly not a stump, but I probably took 70% of the tree out. And when it came back, it came back like it was reborn. It was, it was a reborn couple of citrus trees and they turned out very, very well. Within two years, they were almost the size of the original tree, but they were so much more healthy, so much more trained, and they, they produced very, very well while I lived there. Just remember one thing, skeletal pruning is for spring only and you are done before summer. So wherever you're at, we're talking uh, late March, April, at the latest early May. And the reason for this is a lot of the branches on the insides of those trees have never been hardened off to the harsh summer suns that they would be subjected to if you skeletally prune them later in the season. You know, all you need to do is take a take an orange tree and reduce it by 60% and open up that whole trunk and scaffolding to 90, 95, 100 degree heat, you'll split, you'll split it and you can do a lot of damage and even kill it. So make sure you're six, eight weeks ahead of any summer heat before you start doing skeletal pruning of citrus. And pretty much any particular uh, fruit bearing, if it is not used to that, you do not want to ex expose it to a lot of high heat soon after that pruning. Hey, when we talk about ornamental shrubs, those deciduous shrubs will generally be mid to late winter. If you're snowbound, then it's gonna be a couple weeks before bud break because you're gonna be snowbound. The evergreen shrubs, evergreen shrubs, we obviously do a little pruning during the growing season as whatever taste or effect you're trying to get out of the shrubs. And then the last prune is mid to late fall. Then let them be. Don't go out there and start trying to prune something in late December or January because you're just, you're hurting the plant. It's, it's basically asleep with leaves on it and all the energy is down in the root zone. You're not doing anything any good by exposing very low temperatures to the inside of some of those evergreen plants. All right, let's move on to our last one, the how. The how will surround a lot of what plant it is. You won't prune a tick seed perennial flower the same as a cherry tree, but both will need a little off the top Mac type of approach at a specific point in time. It really will. You know, for you guys, here's a little checklist to consider for the hows uh, when you're approaching your pruning task. Above all else, if you don't take anything away from this, the number one part of this checklist will help you out tremendously. And that is having a quality, quality pruning tool that are well-maintained and extremely sharp when you take on the task. Whether they be hand pruners or lopping shears, pruning saws, pole saws, chain saws, wh whatever they are, they're in top-notch condition and you've maintained them that way and you've stored them that way when they're not in use. If they're machine bound, 
they're well lubricated. If they're chain bound or uh, blade type of thing, they're sharpened to the best that you can possibly do, or you have them sharpened. And lastly, a very good knowledge of how to use each and every one of these tools. They will prevent 95% of all accidents. They really will. There's nothing worse than going after a pruning job with a very dull tool. It will cause you to work harder. It will cause accidents in the long run. So maintain and sharpen all the time. Second part of the checklist is a collection device for your pruning waste. I see so many times when people get out there and they have a pruning task and they buzz through, you know, 15 roses and then they look back on it and go, oh, now I got to pick all that crap up. And they start a whole new chore rather than pruning each rose at a time and it goes in to a collection device then. You clean up as you go along. Don't make double work for yourself, that's just silly. So have something like a wheelbarrow or a couple of large garbage cans or whatever you might have, but you take it with you at each site. Then when you're all done, then when you're all done, if you have a yard and garden waste disposal system that you pay for, it can go in there or you can even roll those yard and garden with you, put everything in as you go. So work a lot smarter and not harder, plain and simple. So that's number two. Third, focus on any diseased or dead wood on things that you are pruning. Perennials, roses, fruit trees, citrus. If they are diseased with any particular thing, remember to sterilize after each cut, but get that stuff out of there. You know, if, if a person comes down with cancer and it's a visible cancer, like a skin cancer or something, hey, it's really best the doctor's gonna tell you, we need to get on this and we need to get on this fast. So. Same thing applies in the plant world. If you have a cherry tree that's full of pseudomonas, most of the time that's a preventative type of disease by keeping things as healthy as possible and not over watering. You know, I lost a cherry tree from pseudomonas when Maestro and I had weed patch and damn, I thought I was doing everything I was supposed to do, but that stuff still crept up in there. And eventually the way I pruned it, I took the freaking tree out. I got rid of it and I did not replant cherry tree in that same hole. I just did not. Remember to sterilize after each cut. So you prevent a spread of any infected type of material into healthy plant tissue elsewhere on the plant. Fourth, and just as important as anything else, is safety. You know, common sense really dictates here. When you're doing pruning, say uh, high ladder work, chainsaws. One of the biggest things I can tell you is watching where you are cutting and knowing where your other hand is in relation to your cut. You start getting in there and reaching and you're, you're, you know, you got a stiff rose bush and you can't quite see all the way in there. Where is that left hand compared to the pruning shear right hand? You don't want to go cutting through your glove and severing a tendon in a finger. Remember things about roses and barberry and oh, what are some, uh, some of the citrus, you know, I talked about the thorns on Eureka lemons and orange trees and stuff. Things like pomegranates have some really good clothing and some hand protection when you go taking on these particular pruning chores. It'll make for a much better experience. And there's nothing like ramming a pomegranate thorn through the palm of your hand because you weren't paying attention when you grab something. You know, really getting your head around this vital landscape task and watching the results. More than anything, guys, is watching the results the following season from your hard work and labor. I guarantee you, it will reinforce, it'll reinforce your knowledge base, it'll reinforce your expertise and make you want to do these tasks rather than dreading them. It really, really will. This is what I have for you this week. Like I said, I didn't go into every single plant and how to prune them. All I'd be doing is double speak from everybody who's already done a lot of work out there in the ethernet. And you can find all of that. Find out exactly the plants that you have in your landscape, figure out what they are and the best approach for all pruning tasks for each one of them. And then, Hey, if you really want to get your head around it really tight, nothing but a keyboard away. You can go on YouTube, the second most used search engine in the world, and go on there and say, how do I prune my blueberry? How do I prune my Washington Naval Orange? And I guarantee you, it'll take you right there. And Coach didn't have to do that for you. 
I really didn't have to do it because there's so many other resources out there. I am sure glad that you are still with me. Hey, don't forget the website out there if you're looking for a couple of extra type of educational tools, the book and the course. Always the 15 stepper is there for you. As usual, I will be over on YouTube later today and you can check out this particular topic in video form. And I should be on the Wisdom app this weekend. I'm so glad that you stayed with me. Sure to appreciate your attention. I will catch you guys next week as always to your landscape success. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you for listening to the Yard Coach Podcast. Don't forget to head over to the website at youryardcoach.com where you will find more DIY landscape education, including the free 15-step DIY landscape checklist, Coach Matt's ebook called Landscaping Simplified, and the flagship digital course, Homescape 1.0. As always, if you have any questions or comments, you can email Coach Matt directly at youryardcoach at gmail.com. We'll see you right here next week.